two or two and a half months. What if something happens with my horse uh, when you're not here? And so we decided, well, just send me some video clips, you know, send me a, an email and we'll we'll see if we can't figure out what's going on and then go from there. So that's kind of when the telemedical aspect of the practice started. And it's been kind of building up ever since. And so now, uh, 20 something years later, it, it comprises about half of our practice. <clears throat> Uh, my family and I recently relocated out to the West Coast, and we've kind of gone uh, transcontinental, if you will, with the practice. So we still have the East Coast practice uh, that's being managed uh, mostly by Dr. Fernando Marquez, who is a veterinarian out of Palm Beach Equine Clinic. And then we handle most of the West Coast stuff. We do go back and forth. I still travel back and forth quite a bit, but not nothing like I used to. And it's going very well. So uh, again, because of the technology that we have available to us uh, today, we can uh, manage cases from afar and uh, it seems to be working very well. Um, and that's pretty much the whole practice uh, uh, summed up very quickly. So you have, are they all under the name Equine Clinic? So Palm Beach Equine Clinic, Atlanta Equine Clinic, and then is it similar in Washington? Is that how the three are connected? It, good, good question. Yeah, Palm Beach Equine Clinic and and the Atlanta Equine Clinic have kind of partnered uh, to accommodate the Atlanta Equine Clinic's cases on the East Coast. Uh, the the practice on the West Coast is called the Atlanta Equine Clinic, which doesn't really fit, but it's a name that's been known for quite a while and and has a reputation. And we thought it would just be easier to stick with it <clears throat> than to uh, you know make up another separate entity. So, yeah, I like it. And I'm so I was so interested when you I mean, first of all, when you mentioned that 50 percent of your practice is telehealth, that is more than I would have ever expected. And that the impetus of that was 20 years ago, videos being sent via email is really cool. And just to see how that's all evolving. And I'm sure it's it's easier and comes more naturally to people now. But it's very cool that that's such a large part of your practice. And I'm sure your guys' clients are glad to have you know, access that doesn't require going out to the farm every time because that can just, you know, everyone hits capacity and scheduling constraints so quickly. They, they do. It's, it's actually allowed us to do something fairly innovative within our practice. And that is to kind of create an equine sports wellness aspect of the practice. So the nice thing about the technology, you know, the video clips, the photos or whatnot is I can veritably look at every horse every day. You know, I can look at 40 horses in a day uh, on a computer versus maybe, you know, at this point in my career, I, I'm pretty smoked after six or seven, you know, in person. So um, it allows us to to kind of stay ahead of problems and, and just constantly make small adjustments to what's happening versus uh, take a more reactive approach, uh, approach and wait for something big to happen and then have to try to mitigate that catastrophe. So, so we like to stay ahead of problems and do little things all the time versus wait for a big problem and then do big things. So again, the, the ability to look at the horses on a regular basis versus an episodic basis kind of enables us to, to do that. So um, it's been very helpful. Our clients love it. Um, it's very cost effective. Of course, the clients end up spending a lot less money this way. Um, uh, and the horses seem to stay in the ring for longer. So it's working out very well. Yeah. How cool. It also reminds me of, I mean, I always struggled with, I, I only really got face-to-face -face time with my vet or interacted with my vet when there was some sort of episode that was, you know, stressful and probably like a call, like, can you come out ASAP and fitting us in between, you know, what's scheduled. And it didn't give a lot of time for like, can you help me understand like why this happened and what the rehab will be like? And just like, help me understand versus, you know, let's get this figured out quickly and in and out. And I felt like I didn't want to ask too many questions because of the nature of that visit. And therefore, like I always had like the most surface level understanding. And that's why I think it's really special to have time like today where there's no rush and we can just learn from you and ask questions without that kind of sense of urgency. And I think the telehealth approach is another situation where it's less, um, you know, less pressure and maybe there's more space for understanding kind of the holistic approach. Um, 
with that, I would love to talk about your book. When did you write the book and what inspired it? Well, that, that's a great question and perfectly timed because um, the, the book actually, what inspired the book was, was what you just alluded to, which is that of our clientele, the clients that really had a good hold on their horse's health, uh, musculoskeletal status, soundness, seemed to do better. They seemed to be more successful and seemed to have a better hold on, on uh, training and campaigning their horses. So we learned pretty early on that our horses that were well-informed and well-educated were going to be more successful. And so the big push behind the book was to try to give horse owners an opportunity to understand a little bit more about what their horse's movement is saying to them. Um, it's kind of what, what we sort of <clears throat> uh, uh, say at the beginning of the book is, you know, well, horses really can't speak to us, but, but in reality they can, they just don't talk like you and I are talking now. They're talking through their movement. And once we learn to know what, what movements mean, uh, different movements mean, it, it really becomes very clear and frankly, very easy to interpret, you know, what's happening there. So the idea was to try to help horse owners um, learn this language, so to speak, the sign language that a horse is portraying and, and, uh, and therefore stay a little bit further ahead of, of managing any issues. So, you know, if you think about, <clears throat> if you think about, uh, you know, keeping a horse sound, and healthy. You know, there's really um, three phases to it, but historically, the veterinary industry, at least the equine veterinary industry, has concentrated on the latter two phases, which is the diagnostics and the treatments. And we have very uh, efficient, very savvy, uh, elegant uh, ways of diagnosing problems. And we have lots of really fancy cool treatment modalities available to us as well. Um, <clears throat> the whole idea behind the book, though, was to try to get the first phase, which happens before that, and that is the recognition of lameness. You know, you think about it, veterinarians don't assess horses uh, that their owners deem to be sound. So if, if the owner thinks the horse is sound, they're not going to summon the veterinarian. The veterinarian is not going to have a chance to evaluate the horse. So the idea behind the book is to try to fine tune the owner's eye to their horse's performance and say, wait a minute, something's wrong there. This horse is, something is different. Something isn't right. Let me summon the vet now versus wait till it becomes a bigger problem. So in other words, the, the attempt to, of trying to shorten the time frame between the onset of the problem and the client's recognition of it, that to me probably has more to do with a successful outcome than anything. You know, there's there's a hundred million dollar facilities out there all over the place, really, that that really can effectually diagnose and treat horses. But a lot of times, by the time the horse gets there, it's too far gone. You know, there's not a whole lot that can be done. And, and you know, I hear vets all the time say, boy, if I could have gotten a hold of this one two years ago, then we'd have something to work with. So so that really comes back to the owner um, and, and, and recognizing that there's an issue or at least trying to stay ahead of it. And it also comes back to the veterinarian from the standpoint of, are you doing anything to help your owner uh, recognize problems and try to stay ahead of it? You know, if we can tackle that part of it. I think we can really push uh, equine performance, wellness and medicine into the next stratosphere. So that's kind of, that was kind of the, the idea behind what we were trying to do with the book. And it seems like a, like a big part of that is just going to be education. Is that like, is that corrected? Like educating people on how to spot these, these, these things that are like previews of what's coming six months or two years down the road. Yes, Kinsey, it, it is education, but it's when most people hear the word education, they, you know, oh gosh, it's fun education though. I mean, we do a lot of these uh, lameness for the layman seminars, and I think people show up at these things not really knowing what to expect, but it ends up being so much fun because um, we're really just looking for visual markers. We're looking for things uh, like, how do you read the sign language? How do you read the movement of the horse? And once you start to get that, 
it really becomes a fun endeavor. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of fun to, to say, oh, I know what that means. I know what this means. And then you start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. You know, my, my thought would always be, you know, before I pull an x-ray machine out of my truck or an ultrasound machine or what have you, I want to already know what the problem is, where it is. And so I'm not trying to diagnose the problem at that point. I'm just trying to confirm or deny my suspicions or glean a little bit more insight into the nature of the problem. But I should already have a really clear picture on what the problem is by the time I get that far. But um, yeah, education, I, I think sometimes can be a scary, daunting word, but, but this is really kind of fun. You know, I think that if, um, if you were talking to somebody that was a, um, an art expert, let's say, and you're looking at two paintings, one of them is, is the original and the other one is a fake. And, you know, for somebody like me, I would have no idea. I, they, they would look probably identical to me. But for somebody that knows what they're looking for, knows what markers to see and how to interpret those, they would look at it in one second. Go, oh, your fake's over there. That one's the real one. And so um, it's pretty cool once you learn how to do that, just to be able to have that skill. And again, it, it improves <clears throat> not only your ability to manage your horse's soundness, but it also improves your relationship with your horse because it's all about the connection. It's all about, you know, your partnership, going through whatever endeavor you're doing uh, as a partner with your horse. And the more you're able to learn and interpret from them, I think the closer the relationship gets, the better it gets and the closer the partnership gets. So, so anyway, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. I've been doing it for a long time and I still enjoy it as much as I ever have. Your enjoyment of it is so clear and it makes it, it's like, makes me excited <laughs> about it. Um, I like the comparison of the painting, the real versus the fake that is helpful to understand like what we're trying to do here. When you mentioned the example of the vet who's like a horse shows up at the clinic and they're like, I wish I would have seen it two years ago. Is that to say that you can look at horses who are sound to like my eye or Kinsey's eye or, you know, not a vet's eye maybe and say, here's where the problem might come in. Like what, what we're talking about, is it looking at a sound and I'm using quotes, a sound horse and being able to kind of foresee problems and therefore prevent them? Or will you just describe more about looking at a horse that we might not be able to tell is, you know, has any abnormality? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of times I think when we initially think about a horse that's sound or a horse that's lame, we think of it one dimensionally, you know, that horse is sound and this other horse is lame, but it's really a multifaceted, um, uh, thing. So what we try to do is we try to break down the movement into a series of, of different aspects. So for instance, <clears throat> let's say we have a horse that's got a sore right front foot or a horse that's got a sore right front fetlock or a sore, uh, or a sore right carpus knee uh, or a horse with a sore right shoulder. In all of those cases, the horse would be displaying a right forelimb lameness. And we would one dimensionally say that horse is lame, but a horse with a sore foot is going to look a lot different than a horse with a sore fetlock, which looks different than a horse with a sore knee and in turn looks different than a horse with a sore shoulder. So depending on what of those structures is the source of the lameness, the horse's expression of that right front lameness will be decidedly different. So we not only just Did we lose him? Like a blank oh. out. Oh, there I am. <laughs> We're just now getting internet out here on the West Coast. So. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. We I we lost you right at the way like the way that it presents itself in the front line. Yeah. Yeah. So again, the the horse with the you know again all of those uh, problems would generate a right forelimb lameness but the horse's expression of that lameness would be decidedly different depending on which of those was the source. 
So we look at markers. We go beyond saying, hey, it's right front. We look at markers to say, does this look like something in the lower limb or in the upper limb or in the mid limb? Does this look like a fetlock? Does this look like a carpus? Does this like a, look like a shoulder? So we, we basically try to answer usually on average about five to six questions that we ask ourselves when we're evaluating a horse. And in answering those questions, we effectually filter out the, the possible scenarios down to one or two things. So that's, that's one of the big things about our telemedical service is we usually try to say, look, this is where your horse's problem is likely going to be. This is how you would confirm or deny that. Um, and then this is how we would orchestrate kind of going about, you know, finishing up your diagnosis and, and implementing a treatment strategy. So, and of course, I don't want to give anybody that's listening the idea that looking at things and, and doing video reviews and whatnot is to replace an on-site examination. The real purpose of this is to replace not doing anything at all. So for instance, if your on-site evaluations are every three months apart, what do you do in between those three months? You just wait and for the next three months or the next six months, whatever that is. So, so this, this constant uh, evaluation uh, basically allows us to just keep tabs on everything. And I've got a lot of clients that will send video clips once a month just to see. And I'll say, yeah, everything looks good. See you next month, you know, uh, just to keep tabs on things. So, so, but again, um, the evaluation, whether it's done in person or on a video clip is not a one dimensional thing. There's a lot of things that go into it. You know, like I said, about five or six things we're trying to answer. And if we can answer even half of those, usually we'll have a pretty clear picture on what's going on. The, the book obviously outlines those things and shows you how to do each one of those individually. And then sort of, of course, at the end, you kind of put it all together as you're looking at lame horses. Um, does that answer your question or does that just take up time? Yes, I am totally tracking with you. And as you're describing the, like the alternate, the alternate is doing nothing between your in-person vet appointments. Yes. That is how we describe Ride IQ too. We we haven't even gotten into really what Ride IQ is with you, but it's audio lessons for your independent rides. So the alternative mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is just, you know, riding on your own without any guidance. <laughs> and right. it's the same right. thing in terms of like, no, it's not a replacement for an in-person lesson, but it does make those independent rides better. So there's some parallels there. It's yes. very similar to how we describe it. Um, I... I'm interested to know how somebody can start. And I think, I feel like the book is a very helpful resource because it's not something that we can cover in an hour, but for somebody who's wanting to train their eye better so that they can have more insight into what's going on with their horse, whether something's presenting itself or not, whether they think it is or not. Um, how do you recommend someone embark on developing their eye? as a non-vet? It's a, it's a good question. And I think that the answer to that would be the, the same answer that, that prompted me to develop my eye. And that is once you realize that a horse with a sore foot, for instance, is going to move differently than a horse with a sore shoulder. Once you've established the fact that there is that disparate movement and that you can predict that a horse with a sore foot in Paris is gonna move similar to a horse with a sore foot in Maryland, is gonna move similar to a horse with a sore foot in California. Once you've established the fact that that information is there and available, then it's like, well, wait a minute, let's let's nitpick this, let's get in, let's get into this, let's sink our teeth into this and figure out, you know, what what this means. So the, the biggest thing to me was coming to the realization that there are those differences that horses will uh, express a certain pattern of movement. We call it a signature, like a gait signature, specific to a certain problem. And then once we realize, wait a minute, these signatures exist, all we have to do is interpret them and learn them and understand. It's kind of like the, the Helen Keller thing. You know, the biggest thing that happened to her 
uh, was to realize that somebody was trying to talk to her. Once she realized that, it, it was all downhill. But until that point, it was very hard. So for me, once I was able to establish, wait a minute, there's a pattern here, then then the learning became easy because I knew that everything I saw had some meaning. I just had to figure out what that meaning was. So for instance, if you, let's say one of the listeners out there uh, had a horse with a weight-bearing lameness and a weight-bearing lameness would be a situation where the horse would feel pain when the foot was on the ground. So let's say, uh, Jessa, I put a rock in your left shoe. You could move your leg around normally when it was in the air, but as soon as you go to apply pressure on that foot, put your foot down, in other words, you're gonna feel the rock in there. You're gonna transfer the weight to the right leg to get off of that. That would be a weight-bearing lameness. Now let's say we you had a non-weight-bearing lameness. Let's say we put a brace on your knee on the left knee. You could stand on the leg very comfortably, but when you go to pick it up and move it forward, we call that action protraction, you, you wouldn't be able to flex your knee. And somebody, somebody would say, hey, why are you walking funny? You're not flexing your knee. That would be a non-weight-bearing lameness. So if, if you predicted, for instance, that your horse that was displaying a purely weight-bearing lameness had an issue in the foot, you're gonna be right almost every time. And the reason for that is because the nature of the lameness directly reflects the nature of the tissue that's causing it. So purely weight-bearing lamenesses are caused by tissues that serve to bear the horse, horse's weight, but they're not really employed when the horse picks the leg up and moves it forward for, during protraction. Um, <clears throat> if you predicted that your horse with a purely non-weight-bearing lameness had a problem in the foot, you're going to be wrong every time. There is no structure in the foot that only serves to move the leg forward, but that doesn't bear weight. So just knowing that, and those are pretty easy things to differentiate visually. You can tell a weight-bearing lameness from a non-weight-bearing lameness very easily. So if everybody out there that's listening could assure, assuredly do this right now. So once they could say, wait a minute, I know that problem, my, that non-weight-bearing lameness is not in the foot. That's, you've already done the first step. You've already said, okay, I've, I know it's not this. It's got to be something else. Once, once you start that process, then it starts to get addictive. Then you're like, okay, what's next? What's next? How much closer can I get? How much more can I learn? So it's, again, knowing that those, that information is there is the biggest thing. Then it's just a matter of, of learning how to, how, you know, seeing the person differentiate between the real and the fake painting makes me say to myself, well, what are they looking at? How do they know? And I want to know what that is, but I already know that there's a difference that they can tell. So I want to know what that is. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing is knowing that the information is there and it's just a matter of how do I, how do I learn this? How do I learn this language? And when you talk about how getting more precise about the cause of the lameness can positively impact a horse's like longevity and performance, why is that? Is that because you are treating it correctly more quickly? Or can you just like connect those dots for me? Like if I'm able to say, this is definitely a non-weight-bearing lameness, it looks like it's in the knee, in what ways will that benefit my horse? Me knowing that specifically versus just he's lame in the front left. Yeah, the, the reason is because the more, the more facets of the movement or the more parameters that you're assessing, the easier it is to pick up on subtle things. So for instance, in veterinary school, uh, when we learned how to assess lameness, and it's still the case, I think a lot of times, is we really learned how to assess a weight-bearing lameness. You know, what we would look for is, and again, <clears throat> when, when you're assessing lameness, it's important to realize that you're actually not seeing the source of the problem. You're not seeing the pain or you're not seeing the neurologic dysfunction or whatever is causing the lameness. What you're seeing actually is what the horse does to avoid the pain or accommodate uh, the, the neuro, neural dysfunction. So you're not seeing the problem, you're seeing the horse's uh, attempt to accommodate the problem. And that's a big difference. So for instance, in the case of a weight-bearing lameness in the right front, 
we don't see the pain in the right front. What we see is the horse transfer the weight to the left front. That tells us that they're lame in the right front. And in, in veterinary school, we were really taught to assess weight bearing issues. So we can, you know, a, a veterinarian can spot a horse with a foot abscess because that's going to generally generate either purely or predominantly weight bearing deficit. Very easy to see, a big head bob, those sorts of things. Non weight bearing deficits look different than that. And that's not something that I think is readily uh, taught and it has a different look to it. So a lot of the, the, the lamenesses that we see on a referral basis have a non-weight burning component because it's just, unless you know what you're looking for, it's not as, it doesn't look the same. So, but we look at, at weight bearing versus non-weight bearing. We look at the flight pattern of the foot. Does, does this foot move differently in the air than the foot on the other side of the horse? We look at the footprints and the footing. Is this footprint steep? Is it shallow? What's the splash of the footing look like? So when you start looking at, you know, a dozen or more different parameters, then it doesn't take as much to see something when, versus looking at just one. And so I think it's the ability to kind of look at all those things that allows us to pick up on things a lot quicker. It's like, so going back to your, your, your point that you made earlier, you know, you have a sound horse and you have a lame horse. Most of them are lame. It's just, can you see it or not? So um, uh, it, you just got to look hard enough. So it's rare that we're going to see a horse that's moving what we would consider to be perfectly normal. Um, if you look hard enough, you'll usually find some difference. And there's usually a reason behind that difference. And what we try to do is figure out what that reason is and address it um, before it becomes something that's, you know, sticking its nose in our business as far as training and campaigning, those sorts of things. So that's exactly what I was curious about. Thank you for walking me through that. <laughs> Poor Kinsey. I've never monopolized the conversation more, <laughs> but I have a lot of questions. I'll Kinsey, I'll be this, my last one, and then it's over to you. <laughs> but as you were describing those, like not small differences, but less obvious differences or differences that we're not um, trained to be perceptive to quite as often. Are there any tools out there that you recommend or you think are reliable? Because I know like there are um, like saddle clips, for example, that will tell you your horse's push off on each leg and it will kind of like ding you if something, if there's variability that doesn't seem normal. Are those reliable or worthwhile at this point in the technology? Do you even want to speak to that? It just comes to mind as you're describing kind of those more subtle differences. Yeah, it's a good question, you know, and I think a lot of these modalities, motion sensors um, are very good. Um, I think personally, I think that the human brain and the human eye and our ability to clinically reason and to interpret multifaceted things is better. So, yeah, I think there's some use there. Um, um, and I think they're helpful. But I also think that um, we have the ability, at least at this point, to be to clarify things even more just with our faculties, with what we have available to us every day. It just takes a little bit of work to do that. It's kind of like talking to your kid in school. You know, there's calculators and there's all these things that they can use as tools, but you want them to learn how to think too. And in reality means that their brain really is more powerful than most of those tools. If you can just get them to believe that, learn them, uh, uh, teach them to listen to that. So I, I think that, yeah, those tools are helpful, but, um, I think that we miss a lot um, if we don't use what we're given and what we have available to us, um, that sort of thing. Yep. Are there any common lameness issues that you see? I mean, I'm sure there are, but what are some examples of common lameness issues that you see due to confirm confirmation faults? Good, good question. I, I just did a consult right before we got on the phone uh, with a horse that's got some confirmational faults that I think has translated into time uh, into some musculoskeletal problems and lameness. Um, <clears throat> confirmation uh, is usually going to dictate 
that certain structures within the horse's body, axial skeleton or limbs, are going to have to undergo more stress than they were designed to undergo. Others may be less, but we worry about certain conformations imposing excessive musculoskeletal or biomechanical stress on tissues, which then predisposes those tissues to injury. And so, for instance, uh, a lot of us maybe have seen horses with a fairly straight hind leg, for instance, and a very relaxed fetlock angle, like when they bear weight, the fetlock kind of wants to sink down to the ground surface. Um, that conformation predisposes horses to excessive tension of the suspensory apparatus, which is one of the main suspending structures of the hind limb. So not all horses with that conformation develop suspensory desmopathy or dis suspensory desmitis, but when a veterinarian sees a horse do that, the hair on the back of the neck kind of stands up and they, they get nervous about those sorts of things. So um, uh, yeah, there's definitely a correlation there. Um, and that's something to think about, you know, for people that are buying horses. Um, we try to interpret conformational abnormalities or predispositions in the light of what the horse is going to be asked to do. So a conformational abnormality that might not affect a trail horse could certainly affect an upper level dressage horse, for instance. So a lot of things that go into it. And, um, you know, conformation doesn't always catch up with horses. Um, there's a few race horses that I was had the luxury of being involved with early in my career. And if I had done the pre-purchase on those horses, I would have steered my clients away from them. But they won millions and millions of dollars because it never did become an issue. Um, there was a predisposition, but it's not the whole picture I, either. So um, uh, something definitely to think about. And there is the correlation that's there. You can't you can't know for sure. Um, so we just try to you know guide our clients the best that we can. So you mentioned confirmation. You mentioned pre-purchase exams. That brings me to X-rays. To what extent do you, what, what's the power of x-rays? When do you lean on them and when do you uh, need to look at the bigger picture, I guess? That, that's a great question. And, and that question alone could, could easily um, satisfy an entire podcast or two of them. Um, we have to think when we, when, and, and there's obviously lots of different imaging modalities. You've got radiography, ultrasonography, scintigraphy, MR, uh, you know, magnetic resonance, lots of different things that we use to try to help us define the nature of a potential pathologic issue. Um, radiographs, we, we call them x-rays. An x-ray is actually a beam that we can't see. It's going too fast. Uh, it produces an image called a radiographic image. That's really what we're seeing. But, but when we look at that image, what exactly are we seeing? Well, uh, uh, first of all, a radiographic images takes a three-dimensional structure and it squashes it down to two dimensions, right? On a, on a film or on a, on a computer screen. The other thing it does is it basically takes all the tissue densities and it puts them in one of three things, either air density, soft tissue density, or bone density. So when we look at a radiographic image, we're really kind of highlighting the bone. That's the main thing that we're looking at. And we're looking for changes or abnormalities in the bone that may suggest the presence of pathology. But what really, what the horse, the horse doesn't really know what the radiographic image looks like. All they know is, does it hurt or not? And what causes pain is inflammation and inflammatory cells are way too small to see on a radiographic image, no matter how good the lateral resolution is, how good the technology is. So there's a gap there, Jessa, between what we're looking at on a radiographic image and what the horse is encountering as far as how it feels. For instance, let's say that you walloped your knee, you're, you're working on your house and you hit your knee with a hammer. You know, first thing you would say is some expletive. And then you might go to urgent care and they take a film of your knee, a radiographic image and say, your, your knee's perfectly fine. Everything looks perfectly normal but your other knee really looks like a mess. That's where your problem is. You might say, well, my other knee hasn't hurt for 10 years, but this one is aching like nobody's business. And that's because they're looking for changes that
that haven't that aren't there or haven't yet occurred. Meanwhile, you're feeling inflammation that's right there that hurts. And we can't see that on a radiographic image. So a lot of times what we tend to do is we tend to equate diagnostic image abnormalities like an x-ray image and pain, but we really can't do that. And that the reason why that's such an important topic is because a big part of what we do in our practice is to try to identify those differences. You know, for instance, yes, that fetlock is abnormal, but the horse isn't even lame in that limb. That's not the problem. So, so again, you know, I think to really do our clients the best service, the professionals should have a pretty clear idea on what the problem is going to be before they acquire the image. Then they know, then that it can, for, oh, this makes sense. So for instance, you take a picture of a, of a horse's foot and you see all kinds of changes in it. That horse is displaying a pur purely non-weight bearing lameness. You can say that that's an ugly radiograph. A horse has no idea that there's a problem there. That's not the problem because it wouldn't limp that way. It wouldn't look that way if that's where the problem was. So it's such a good question because it's one part, it's one tool that we use. And because the, the uh, technology is so good nowadays, it's tempting to just say, aha, there you go. Let's treat this. Let's treat that. But, um, you know, we have to be smarter about that. We have to be uh, more clinically in tune. You know, back in the 1950s, and I learned from a lot of really good vets that were practicing back then, most of the barns didn't have uh, electricity. So they didn't have the ability to take a film. They had to know what they were looking at. And, you know, you walk around with some of these people and, oh, yeah, that's a right front fetlock. That one's got a sore hock. This one's got a stifle problem. They could just tell looking at it like the like the art expert does when they look at the painting. And we, we kind of lost a little bit of that because the technology is going the other direction so fast. But I think that's still such an important part of what we're doing, both from the standpoint of the professional and the horse owner as well, because all this stuff is there. It's looking us in the face all the time. We just have to know what we're seeing. Does that answer your question or? Okay. Good. Absolutely. I mean, that, yeah, what everything you're going into, I feel like there's a million, a million different yes. paths we could take this yes. conversation. Um, we have so many questions here that I want to try to get to some of them. A, a couple of people are asking about injections. What are your overall thoughts on regular injections for performance horses? That, that's a great question. And that is going to depend a lot on, on what you're injecting. So, you know, let's say you can inject a tendon sheath, you can inject uh, a bursa, you can inject a joint. If we just stick with the joints for, for the sake of the argument, you know, there's lots of different types of joints in a horse. So a lot of times when people talk about injections, they think about hock injections. And the hock is actually comprised of four joints. The two upper joints, for all intents and purposes, are doing the vast majority of the flexion. The two bottom joints, those are called the distal intertarsal and tarsal metatarsal joints. They're separated by cuboidal bones, and they're kind of flat joints. It's kind of like the space in between a stack of pancakes. Horse doesn't really need those joints. So those would be considered clinically insignificant. You know, and horses that are refractory to other forms of therapy, I'll surgically or chemically arthrodes those joints, fuse them, and you can't detect an alteration in their gait. So those distal hock joints on one side of the spectrum really aren't very important. Now let's go to the complete opposite side of the spectrum and look at a fetlock on the front end of the horse, thoracic fetlock. Per unit area, uh, front end fetlock is going to assume more weight bearing load and move more than any other joint in the horse. So that is the most significant. So a little bit of arthritis in a fetlock is going to go a long way. Think of it from this standpoint. Let's say your little toe joint versus your knee. You know, your little toe joint is going to have to hurt pretty bad before somebody's going to notice you limping. Your knee, just a little sore and somebody will see a gait deficit when you're walking. So, so in joints that have clinical insignificance or carry less clinical significance, we can, we as veterinarians can have the luxury of being somewhat aggressive with respect to our therapeutic strategy because we don't have the concern of imposing deleterious effects. 
So in other words, as a performance veterinarian, I like to stay ahead of sore hocks because the, the nature of the joint being what they are, not very important, allows me the liberty to do that. And then I can stay ahead of all these secondary compensatory issues that goes along with a horse that's got sore hocks. On the other hand, if I've got a horse with a sore fetlock, you're going to have a hard time getting me to stick a needle in there right off the bat because now we've got a different situation. Wait a minute. I can get some inflammation out of there, but am I doing something to promote uh, regeneration, synovial integrity, keep the joint happy and healthy and normal pliability? So fortunately, now we have lots of savvy therapeutic modalities, biologics, uh, autologous products that we can pull out of the horse and mix up. And, and so we have a lot of different options to us. But when we think about injections in general, the first thing that I think about is what am I injecting and what what is the best for the long term care of the horse? So so, yeah, I think injections have their place. Um, if, if you have a horse with an inflamed joint and you don't inject it because you don't like to inject horses, we have to realize the inflammation in there, those inflammatory cells are releasing degradative enzymes called lysozymes and other chemical mediators that are chewing up that joint. So it's not a good thing to have inflammation in a joint. And so theoretically, in some cases, depending on the severity of the inflammation, injecting the joint, even with a steroid might be better than not injecting it. So there's lots of things that go into the decision-making process um, the age of the horse, the level of competition, the nature of the joint, the location of the joint, um, the type of product that you're thinking about uh, using. So again, it all comes down to the, to the idea of how do we, number one, address this issue that we're treating and does it help us steer clear of secondary issues down the road? And sometimes injections, the way to do that, a lot of times you can get away without injections. If you have a horse that's got a sore knee, um, sometimes just getting the horse off the front end and getting the hind end more comfortable is enough to attenuate that pain and make the horse more comfortable without having to stick a needle in there. So, so injections themselves, of course, people think of it based on the old racehorse days when they were getting stuck every couple of weeks with an aggressive steroid. There's lots of different options now, lots of more savvy, more elegant approaches that are much healthier, but even so, we still go through the mental process of trying to decide, number one, what we're trying to accomplish, and number two, can we do this in a way that only helps the horse in the long term versus uh, hurts the horse? What a great explanation. And I <laughs> like smiling the whole time you're talking because I'm actually understanding what you're saying, which, I mean, you, you wrote the right book. Um, because you do such a great job of breaking this down so that we can actually learn. Like it's not so basic that there's, it's you're helping us learn things, but so often like I've spoken to vets and I just feel this like weight on my chest because I don't understand half the words they're saying. And then I feel, you know, a little bit incompetent and very dependent. So I really appreciate your skill at explaining these things. Well, thank um, you. The comparisons and the analogies are so helpful too. So another question that we got is what are some of the most common mistakes that you see people make with their horses day-to-day -day care that have a big impact on soundness or longevity? Does anything come to mind? That's a really great question. Um, uh, I don't know that I've actually thought about that before. Um, um, I think, you know, I guess the, the most obvious answer uh, in this setting would be just their inability to pick up on what their horse is screaming at them sometimes or trying to tell them, uh, I guess would be a more polite way to say it. Um, uh, you know, if you can learn just a few things uh, that helps you interpret the sign language that your horse is displaying every time they take one step, they're saying something, either that they're comfortable or that they're not. But if you can learn to assess that, the idea would be to recognize an issue earlier. You know, the, every performance veterinarian would have the same primary complaint, and that is that I, I wish I'd gotten to this sooner. You know, if you think about inflammation, um, 
you know, initially when it first occurs, it's there and it's there and it's kind of doing its thing and it's causing all sorts of havoc. Eventually, a lot of the changes that the inflammation uh, precipitates becomes irreversible. Then you're really stuck. Then it doesn't really matter what you're doing. You can't reverse it. It's already too far gone. So the idea would be to recognize the problem while it's still within that highly effective treatment window, if you will. Um, and I think that um, if a client, you know, probably the best answer to that question is that if a client even suspects that there's an issue, not even sure, but something doesn't feel or look right, to summon your, your veterinary team as soon as you can. And most vets now, I think, are willing to look at a video clip. You know, if you can't wait for an appointment, which I understand, you know, veterinarians can only do so much physically in a day, but it only takes a few minutes to look at a video clip and they could get back to you and say, you know, everything looks good to me or wow, boy, I'm glad you sent this. We need to get on, you know. So anytime that something doesn't look or feel right, um, I would take a video clip and send it to your veterinarian um, or your farrier or your trainer or somebody that could potentially, not that you're trying to get a bunch of, you know, I always, I always tell people, if you want somebody's opinion, uh, trot your horse or open up the hood of your car. You know, you'll get more opinions than you can shake a stick at. So it's not that you're trying to get everybody's input, but but what you're trying to do is you're trying to identify the presence of a problem as quickly as you possibly can. Because when you do that, the problem isn't as big and hasn't been there for as long and it's going to be a lot easier to successfully address. So that would be the answer is try to, try to do your best to get to it quicker. That makes perfect sense. And what this is kind of an interesting one that we got in um just curious to see what you have to say there's been some debate about the benefit of icing legs versus the potential detriment of doing it too often what are your thoughts on ice as part of the care routine and how often when to use it good good question uh personally i don't i wouldn't say there's uh, a lot of detriment that i've observed in my career to icing i would say that there's a lot of times when you're not going to get a positive effect from it but I wouldn't say that it's deleterious uh, in, in a lot of cases. Icing is going to work best pursuant to an acute injury. So it, like the first 72 hours after the horse sustains an injury and there's a lot of inflammation, that's where ice is going to do most of your work for you. Uh, after about four or five days or a week, it's going to have less of an effect on that acute inflammatory response. So what you're basically trying to do is with ice is you're trying to promote vasoconstriction, shrink the vessels around the injury site to try to mitigate some of that inflammatory response. With inflammation comes lots of pain, lots of swelling, fibrosis, scar tissue, all sorts of stuff that we don't want. So ice is very effective initially at steering clear of a lot of that uh, reaction. After some time, you're not going to get as much benefit. That's where something else like a liniment or a, a spray or a, a sweat or something like that might work a little bit better. Um, but that said, I, I can't think of too many instances where ice actually was not good unless, you know, you ice it to the point where the leg becomes numb. Then the horse sustains an injury because they can't feel their leg. I guess that's possible. I've never seen that, but but um, uh, definitely beneficial on the front side of problems. Makes sense. Yep. Don't go too crazy with the ice, but <laughs> otherwise right, you probably right. won't be doing harm. Um, we got an interesting question in chat and I'm not sure, I'm not sure if, if it's something that you'll be able to answer. She said, and I'm sorry, I don't know who it is. It's just coming through to me as Facebook user. Is there a way for us lay folks to determine the difference between a lameness versus a weakness? And when should we as riders try to work on improving strength versus making things worse? I'm not sure what that second part means, but lameness versus weakness is an interesting um, thing to consider. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, there are two completely different things. So weakness could be a cause of a lameness. A lameness is an alteration in the way that the horse moves. 
That could be a result of something that hurts. It could be a result of a biomechanical restriction or relaxation. It could be a result of a weakness. Um, uh, but there are two different things. So, you know, a lot of times a client will say, oh, the, the horse isn't lame. He's just weak or it's just the way he moves. Well, if, if, his, if his movement is not normal, then he's lame. And we also a lot of times equate symmetry with or asymmetry with lameness. You know, the horse's left side moves different than the right side. Um, and of course, that is clear indication of lameness because we can detect the difference in movement from one side to the other. But that's not really the definition of lameness. Let's say that both of your knees, Jessa, really hurt. But it was comparable pain. You know, you'd like to favor the left one by overloading the right one, but that's only going to accentuate pain in your right and vice versa. So you really, you can feel the pain, but you're in a conundrum. You don't really have a way to escape it without accentuating it. So you can't really express that. So accordingly, you move symmetrically. You're not limping. You know, you might move funny because your knees hurt and you're kind of waddling along, but you're not really able to express that. So um, that's called bilateral suppression. So there's certain things that happen that, that kind of put horses in a jam where they'd like to express it, but something's keeping them from expressing it. And again, we don't see the problem. We see what the horse does to avoid it. And if they can't do that thing, then we sometimes misinterpret that as the horse being sound. A lot of times people misinterpret that as the horse being weak, which is what I was getting back to. So weakness is, is a cause of leanness, um, a potential cause of leanness, but it's not the same thing. So if your horse isn't moving symmetrically, that is a lame horse. Or if your horse is not moving normally, let's say the stride shorter than normal, that is a lame horse. Um, now, again, you know, weakness can cause that. Generally, when we see weakness factor into a horse's performance, it's usually associated with the hind end, and it usually generates kind of a sloppy functionality of the stay apparatus. So horses that are weak behind will, will have a non-weight-bearing lameness. The stay apparatus might be interfering. Let's say the stifle gets a little sticky. That generates a non-weight-bearing lameness. If there's a weight-bearing component, then it's not weakness. Does that make sense? So that's kind of how we can say, yeah, he's weak, but that's not the only issue. If it was pure weakness, it would look like this. This horse has other aspects of the lameness that tell us there's something else involved. So understood. And the only thing I was going to add is Kara in chat. <laughs> she helped me out with who it was from. So thank you, Kara, for that great question. <laughs> and that does make sense. Yeah, great it question. sounds it sounds like more often than not, if you're saying weakness, like you should get extra curious and kind of like check your math on that. Well, certainly if it's asymmetric. So if, if, if one leg is weak and the other on the other side of the horse is not weak, then yeah, it, maybe there's a weakness there. But why is that? There's got to be some underlying pathology that's making one leg weaker than another. Um, if it's bilateral, and it certainly could be weakness, um, you know, to me, the first thing I do is I try to determine if there's a weight bearing component to the lameness. Because if there's a weight bearing component, it hurts that the legs on the ground. That's beyond just being weak. You know what? What would, would cause that be that? a flexion test? Well, you could do a to, flexion to test to help that? delineate to help delineate that. Yep. So, um, uh, but you first of all, if you identify that there's a weight bearing component, you say, okay, something hurts when the horse is bearing weight. Um, we need to figure out what that is, and that's where you kind of look at the aspects of the movement. You know, does it look like a hawk? Does it look like a stifle? Does it look like a fetlock, presuming it's a hind leg? Um, and so you kind of go about that. And then, of course, the on-site exam, you, you know, what I like to do is I like to play a little game with myself, which is where I, I watch the horse go, say, on a video or something, predict what the problem is, then see if I could prove or deny that, you know, uh, see how close I got which is kind of fun because it's all of this is puzzles, right? It's all about puzzles. And the more puzzle pieces we get, the, the cleaner, more nitpicky we can get with it. Um, usually the closer we get. So. 
I would love to be a fly on a wall for those, those times when you're testing yourself. Um, so Kaylee is asking, what are your recommendations or what is your kind of go-to recovery plan for horses with a, a back coming back from a hind suspensory? Hind suspensories are, um, those are the things that keep us up at night. Um, it's a common problem, uh, particularly in dressage horses. You can have it either up at the top of the, uh, the leg, the, the cannon bone, which we call uh, a suspensory desmopathy at its origin, or it can also be associated with the lower aspect of the suspensory ligament, the branches, or it can involve another part of the suspensory apparatus. So when we think of the suspensory, we think of the suspensory ligament, but it's that apparatus is actually comprised of that ligament, the straight and oblique sesmoidian ligaments, the cruciate and short sesmoidian ligaments. There's a lot of different components to that. But um, the answer to the question is, I presume that the listener is referring to uh, high suspensory dysmopathy or a PSL, uh, proximal suspensory ligament dysmopathy. Um, and that would depend on a number of things as far as the rehab. So when we think about rehab of a suspensory injury, uh, we think about what is the severity of the injury? Where did it occur? Was it at the origin or was it just distal to the origin? Was it in the core of the ligament in the central aspect of the limit ligament or was it on the side? To what length did that injury occur? Is it just a really short area or does it extend halfway down the cannon bone? Were the ligament fibers completely torn, which we call a core lesion, or were they just strained, stressed a little bit? Um, was there any predisposing factors to that? Does the horse have a straight pelvic limb conformation with a relaxed fetlock angle? That's going to be critical because we have to think about, let's say we get them over this, what are the chances of this happening down the road? Is there anything that we can do in addition to the rehab, such as corrective trimming or shoeing, to impose less challenge to that suspensory ligament down the road? So taking all those factors into account, what we would normally do is, number one, shoe and trim the horse in a way that is optimal, that pampers that suspensory ligament. In other words, we're going to try to get that ligament uh, to do what it needs to do, but with as little challenge as possible. Take it out of the picture. That usually translates into transfer, transferring some of the uh, applied stress to the suspensory apparatus, to the flexor apparatus. Oftentimes in the hind end, that means lowering the heel, lengthening the toe, the application of a suspensory shoe with thin branches or barefoot. But the, the shoeing is going to be a critical part of the success of this. Second thing would be to employ a rehab program that in is intended to impose challenge or stress to the scar tissue that's forming in that damaged tissue, but only so fast that the tissue has time to model and remodel in, a, in adaptation to that applied stress. So one of the things that happens is if we bring a horse back from injury and we're, we're rehabbing too quickly, you know, any any um, stress that we impose on the tissue, it takes time for that tissue to say, okay, I, I got this. Now I have to strengthen and accommodate myself for this and build up the collagen and, you know, kind of go through the process. If we don't allow enough time for that process to occur, then we predispose the horse to a recurrence. Usually when they recur, they'll tear the old bad tissue and usually take a little bit of normal tissue with it. So it's kind of a one step forward, two steps back sort of thing. So we try to set up a rehab program that has that time frame built in. In other words, that gives the tissue enough time to adapt to what you did yesterday, today, and then so on and so forth. So that generally with a suspensory, the first thing you do is give them time off to allow that to heal and allow the scar tissue to form, organize, and mature. The second phase is the rehab, which is what this question is pertaining to. And that's generally anywhere a minimum of 90 days usually. So day zero is the last day of rest. Day 91 is your first day of regular work. And then you break it down in little pieces, just do a little more each day um, 
just give the tissue time to remodel. And if something does happen, you don't throw it over the cliff. You know, you just, oh, wait a second. Let's back up again before something catastrophic happens. But but that said, those can be stubborn things. And so, um, and how stubborn usually depends on the horse's conformation, age, the uh, what the client's trying to get out of this, you know, what's, you know, is it, is this horse just going to be a trail horse or do they want to get a bronze in the next Pan Am games, you know, or anywhere in between. Uh, and then also um, what, what avenues we have available to us with respect to trimming and shoeing. So we try to get it from every possible angle we can. Of course, we can implement therapeutic modalities, you know, stem cell therapy, shockwave therapy, those sorts of things to help our cause. But the long and short of it is you're trying to put the tissue, get get it as strong as it can possibly be, but at the same time, get it to do as little as it has to do to get the job done. So the combination of those things usually is what gives us the best chance for success. That's super helpful. And we, we've taken you over the hour now. This has been so enjoyable. I know I'm a book buyer. I will. I'm so excited to read the book because I feel like empowered by, you know, trusting myself to understand at least like a portion of this stuff, which is really nice. Um, so I, the book is out there for anyone who's interested. It's called equine lameness for the layman. Um, Dr. Grizel, where else can people find you? And then second part of that question, do you take telehealth clients who are not in-person clients or is that a service used for your in-person clients? That, that's a great question. Um, you, you can reach me anywhere. Um, um, uh, we have a, one of our telehealth uh, websites is called soundhorseadvice.com. So our contact information is there. Um, of course, um, the Atlanta Equine Clinic is, is online. Um, our contact information is there as well. Um, with respect to uh, telemedical assessment of horses, um, that actually requires what's called a veterinary client patient relationship or VCPR. So for instance, if somebody says, hey, what do you think of that horse? And I say, oh, it's lame in the right front. It sounds pretty innocuous, but by saying that and being a licensed veterinarian, I'm actually practicing veterinary medicine with that comment. So because I'm practicing vet practicing veterinary medicine, I need to abide by the, the ethics and the laws that encompass our profession. So, so really um, for me to just be out there giving opinions all over the place is, is going to potentially not be very productive. So I can, I can um, review and assess horses in one of two circumstances. And this is primarily what I do, either clients uh, of our clinic that I've seen in person or that one of our associates in the clinic has seen. Or um, I do work for a lot of veterinarians that are looking at lame horses and consult us um, with respect to what our observations and our thoughts are about how the horse is moving and maybe giving some guidance or direction with respect to the diagnostic work, workup or treatment. So that, that latter case is called teleconsulting. So it's actually between veterinarians. And in that case, I would actually be uh, um, using the VCPR that was established by the primary veterinarian to consult on that case. So I kind of work through their VCPR. Otherwise, I work through my own. But it's not good practice for me to just uh, uh, accept a, a video of a client in a state that I'm not licensed that I don't know. I mean, certainly I'll have an opinion. I always do, but it's, it's, um, we, we try to abide, you know, keep it's, it protects the integrity of our profession. And it also protects, uh, the client clientele from fraudulent activities, you know? Absolutely. And I'm glad we got to it because I think after listening to this, you may have, you may have been receiving some videos. <laughs> so I think that that's a really good um, explanation. And also just thing for all of us to know, like how that works from a veterinary veterinarian's perspective. Um, yeah. If anyone's embarking on telehealth for their horse. So this has been immensely enjoyable and educational. You said at the beginning, but you said, you know, education, but fun. And I'm with you. It's a lot <laughs> it was of fun. very fun. 
So Good. thank you again for spending the hour with us and for teaching us so much during that time. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. It was fun and the hour flew by and I, you know, I, I feel like I could do it for another six hours. I wouldn't do that to y'all, but I feel like I could. So thank you. Right there with you. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, wherever you are. Enjoy.